So welcome. I'm so pleased to have this important conversation with you today. Um, as we begin, I would like to first acknowledge that I'm here on Salt Spring Island, um, which is in the unceded and traditional territory of the Halkomenum and Sinchothan speaking peoples. When I say this, I am recognizing the displacement of Indigenous peoples from the land, breaking of culture, language and families, systemic racism of government institutions that cause great harm and block access to the fundamentals of a good life. I also honor the knowledge keepers, the elders who inspire resilience and the warriors who demand justice. I believe that it is the responsibility of all Canadians to listen to the stories and to take a stand for Indigenous rights and social justice. As well, I know that there will be people who watch this conversation who have lost loved ones due to drug poisoning deaths. We grieve for this loss of life and the sadness and pain it creates for the families and friends of those lost. For me, I am holding a friend and ally in my heart who lost his life in 2018 and who continues to inspire me to create inclusive spaces and deepen my care for others. So Donald, thank you for being here and for participating in a Salt Spring Forum conversation on drug policy reforms. I really appreciate uh, your robust career in this area and currently leading important work as the Executive Director of the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition. I've heard you speak and respond to the fentanyl drug toxicity crisis and I appreciate your wisdom and perspective as you advocate for changes in policy and our society as a whole. So I look forward to what you have to say today. So here we go. Um, I'd like to start off with where we are right now. Um, it's been six years since British Columbia announced the Provincial Drug Poisoning Health Emergency. Last month, the 2020 numbers uh, came in and it was reported that 1,716 people died from drug poisoning in our province this last year which translates to about five people a day. How has the COVID pandemic impacted the existing drug poisoning crisis? Well, it is a, it is a, a, a terrible time, really, um, in British Columbia, in Canada, and in many other parts of the world with regard to what you're talking about. Um, and globally, um, as well as locally, things have deteriorated significantly uh, before COVID um, and may been made much worse because of COVID and the disruptions in our lives and in our uh, illegal economies uh, uh, globally. And uh, BC is a particularly um, hard hit place on the planet uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, drug market becoming extremely toxic over the last six years um, and taking the lives of, you know, upwards of 5,000 people during, during that time. Um, last year being the historical worst um, ever in the history of BC for these kinds of, uh, of deaths. Um, so we're really at a point that, um, the, the something has to give here in terms of our response to this. Uh, and what m so many people don't understand is that this is, it, it's, it's sort of like global warming, climate, climate change. It's, it's so bad now. And it's mostly because of our drug policies mm -hmm. and the policy framework that we continue to use year after year after year with uh, increasingly bad, worse results. Mm -hmm. And we refuse to actually call the question, should we be doing something different? Um, so my heart goes out to all of the families and uh, people in communities in British Columbia who have struggled with such loss this year if it, if you didn't lose someone to covid in bc this year you may have lost someone to uh the drug toxicity crisis mm -hmm. thank you yeah i i understand what you're saying in terms of um sort of the overall picture and putting it into perspective and how it's impacting folks in bc um and across the country um 
I'd like to talk to you and hear from you in terms of this idea of transformation, transforming, you know, what it looks like in terms of drug policies and uh, impact to others. How do we move from a system that currently is around criminalization, enforcement, and sort of patchwork crisis response to um, what I've heard you talk about in terms of socially just and human rights perspective? What could that approach look like? Yeah, I think I think that's where we have to go. And part of the reason I'm so sort of passionate about taking another run at this is because this is the second uh, drug toxicity crisis that I've been engaged in. So in the 1990s, British Columbia was plunged into a very similar crisis uh, when the drug, the illegal drug market changed and it changed, uh, became more toxic. And heroin became more more concentrated, more powerful, stronger than people were used to. And hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people died in the uh, 1990s in British Columbia. Mm. So we, we started to do, we started to ch change things during the 90s, uh, during the 2000s. We started to begin to try to introduce new types of uh, attitudes, uh, philosophies, interventions. We started to begin to accept that people will continue to use substances and that maybe we need to put our efforts to uh, trying to uh, prioritize safety um, and, and, and to stop pretending that um, through criminalization and uh, pro drug prohibition that we will actually succeed in getting rid of this toxic market, uh, actually succeed in convincing people to not use these substances. Substance use is something we do as people. We, If you look at pharmaceutical uh, use in North America, we love drugs. Mm -hmm. We love alcohol. We love tobacco. Um, we are a drug using species and we have found ingenious ways to alter our consciousness through substances over, over the millennia. Um, so, so we're, we're at a point where the sad part is we've had to go through a crisis four times worse than in the nineties to again, open that door to perhaps maybe getting some level of consensus that what we've been doing needs to be totally thrown out and we need to transform our the way we respond to substance use in society. We need to acknowledge that people use substances for a very good reason in most cases, um, that our society does create casualties who are traumatized, who are dislocated, who are in full of pain, whether it be physical, psychological, uh, spiritual, um, and that substance use is something that people reach for, uh, for a whole range of reasons, to relax, to sleep better, to numb a pain, um, to yeah, to escape um, all sorts of all sorts of reasons. And we've been pretending that we can we can stop people from using so-called bad drugs, which are the ones we made illegal, uh, and really ignoring for the longest time alcohol and tobacco. Um, we've turned our attention towards the harms of tobacco recently. In the last 30 years, we've made some progress around mm -hmm. that. Alcohol, we seem to don't mind how, when, how people drink, uh, consume alcohol. It's a fairly uh, open liberal market. Um, and uh, we had the epiphany a couple of years ago around cannabis. And so over, overnight, we transformed how we view cannabis after 30 or 40 years of a growing um, acknowledgement that cannabis prohibition was not working. It was, it was not working and for anybody. It was criminalizing otherwise <laughs> law-abiding citizens or not harming anyone by, by using cannabis. And it created a big underground market and uh, industry uh, and, and so what happened there? Um, I think I was mentioning in our previous talk that the government came along and they suddenly realized that they, the, the public supported 
uh, regulating cannabis in a different way, not through the criminal law, not through the criminal prohibition, but through a, uh, a public health oriented framework. And the goals of cannabis uh, regulation were to uh, protect youth, keep cannabis out of the hands of youth, mm-hmm. um, to keep uh, f- uh, money out of the hands of organized uh, crime and criminals, and uh, to allow uh, a reasonable access for adults to uh, smoke, uh, consume uh, in whichever way they wanted a, a regulated product that was uh, that they knew what was in it. It was it was actual real cannabis that was growing uh, in, in 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 certain ways. And so we're we're at a point now where we've started down that road of uh, changing the way we um, address uh, a, a previous sort of injustice when it came to cannabis. Um, the same logic applies to all the other substances, and I think if we can begin to a move towards decriminalizing people who use substances, think of better ways, safer ways to regulate uh, these products is, and what we do well, uh, we regulate things, that's what we do, we regulate all sorts of things in society. <clears throat> it's not a foreign concept that we can move and put our energy into more of a health uh, and social uh, approach uh, to responding to substance use in society i know that was a long that was a long no, answer no. <laughs> uh, it, it's a complex but, question so you know okay. it's, it requires uh, uh, a broader answer than just you know here's how we do it and that's the way that it goes trans- yeah transformation is is a process and uh i would like to think uh we are on the precipice especially in Canada, and I would challenge us as Canadians, we have a chance to do something that's world leading. Mm-hmm. Um, the The emperor has no clothes when it comes to drug prohibition. It has catastrophically failed mm-hmm. for a mm-hmm. hundred years. It's failed with disastrous consequences, punishing people, uh, caging people, creating a robust transnational global market worth $400 billion uh, in the illegal drug market. So no, no one, it, it, our, drug policies, our drug policies are really marketing strategies. They're government marketing strategies sort of saying, yes, we're going to do something about this problem when everyone knows nothing is going to change. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so we so what would it look like if we were to make some big steps? You know, we spend billions of dollars on enforcement and for a system that punishes some folks of our society. Um, and you know, if if you looking at the knowledge that you've gained over all of this time and the work that you do and see, where would you redirect those billions of dollars spent on enforcement? Where would you? you know, um, restructure our priorities? I, I think we talk about them all the time when we're, we're uh, talking about how to solve this problem. All these other problems come up, right? Mental health, uh, mm-hmm. housing, uh, employment, poverty. Um, there's so many places the uh, funds can go towards supporting people, supporting people who uh, become dependent on substances, for example. It's really hard to get help if you are uh, become addicted to a substance. So what, why aren't we putting money there and shifting money from, you know, the criminal justice system? This was this was a key recommendation of Chief Coroner Vince Kane in 1994 in British Columbia, responding mm-hmm. to the first crisis. He said, this is a health and social issue. We need to we need to reallocate funding from criminal justice, courts, police, prisons to health and social programs. Um, it was a brilliant report uh, commissioned by the government of the day, and it sat on shelves. So, there, so there's so many, so many places we could be uh, shifting the focus to supporting people. Uh, some of the some of the best ways to prevent substance use in 
their life is supporting single parent families uh, in the first and second year of uh, them having children. So mm -hmm. early mm -hmm. childhood support, um, it, it, trying to minimize the trauma that people experience as they're growing up, uh, those sorts of programs. Um, that's where we need to be investing in people so that people can grow up and, and, and navigate the, the, uh, the terrain of substances that they will come into contact and uh, to make wise decisions about uh, using these substances. That's right. part of how we would transform it. Uh, but to get there, we have to take on the world and that's where Canada could provide the leadership, just as they did with cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, the drugs are illegal because of uh, treaties that were signed in 1961 and uh, 71 and 88 that uh, commit all countries to uh, enforcing a prohibition on certain substances. Um, and cannabis was one of those substances. And Canada was able to lead the way uh, on uh, a national, actually it was Uruguay was the first country to oh, uh, legalize wow, uh, cannabis. Okay. A little old Uruguay. Um, and um, they did it when uh, the president, uh, Mujica of uh, Uruguay was asked, why did he, um, why did he, Push so hard to legalize cannabis in their country and he said because it was the right thing to do mm. only 30 percent of the of the population supported it at the time but he felt so strongly that it was uh, so unjust to be criminalizing and punishing a lot of young people who were using this substance that uh, they they needed to do something canada followed um a, a few years later and that was very big. It was a G7 country doing something that was clearly outside the international drug treaty uh, space. Um, and there was a lot of nervousness in Ottawa, and um, but they were pretty clear that the prime minister had said, we are going to do this. And mm -hmm. we came up with a plan, we did it. Um, and there were no consequences. There were no consequences from the, the International Narcotics Board that looks after, looks over the treaty, treaty compliance. There were some finger wagging and some wrist slapping in reports. Um, but other countries had been through that when they in, it, it implemented safe injection sites in Switzerland and Germany, for example. The International Narcotics Board had slapped them on the wrist and wagged their fingers at them. And really, the, the International Narcotics Board is uh, it's a paper tiger that's holding this this very very harmful global uh, machinery of prohibition together with all sorts of empty threats uh, among countries so it's time for that kind of leadership and we as we as citizens should be saying hey we did it once before let's do it again it would even have bigger impact if we were to move towards regulating these substances through a, a public health uh, framework. It sounds like um, these recommendations or the discussion around decriminalization actually started in the you know 90s or thoughts around what could it look like. Um, is conversation happening right now? I know that BC has asked for an exemption um, to decriminalize yep. for personal possession um, at a provincial level. Um, but what do you think would it really take for the decision makers to actually implement it? Is it public support? Is it, you know, more deaths? What what is it going to take for folks to actually who are in a position of power and decision making around this to, as you said earlier about the leader of Uruguay, do the right thing? I'm I'm afraid it it may take another few thousand people to die. Uh, it, it, it will take our public institutions to actually speak up uh, and like our, our boards of trade and our community serving organizations to all, all stand up and say this must stop. This policy is, has failed. It's, it's time to literally get rid of it. And, and that's, 
you know, I've been asked to give the government advice on drug policy. Well, it, it, you know, if you've ever had an old car that you've nursed around along for years and years and years, and you and you finally, you, if something goes wrong with it, you've put all sorts of money into it, you love it dearly, you take it to the mechanic, and the mechanic looks at it and says, get rid of this car. It's not fixable. So because it, you've kept it for too long, you cannot fix it. So that's exactly where we are with our drug policy. Mm -hmm. When asked for advice, and I'm not alone, there are many people that agree that we, we cannot fix this drug policy. It is so fundamentally flawed and the foundations need to be, uh, we need to build, rebuild. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is the opportunity here. And out of out of this disaster, we have a chance to bring the best minds together. You you see how committed public health is to responding to the COVID pandemic. Absolutely. It's been, you know, it's been, you know, it's such a big problem. It's been magnificent to see some of our our brilliant public health folks taking this on and trying to do. Uh, sort of mass education, uh, look at the science, develop the science, uh, uh, modeling, uh, behavior modification techniques with populations about travel or no travel or stay home or, you know, be careful, wear masks and trying to do this incredibly complex piece of work. And it's been magnificent. Um, and Adrian Dix has been magnificent as a minister, getting there every single day, deferring to public health, mm -hmm. deferring mm -hmm. to the public health experts. The politicians have not done that with this side-by-side -side, uh, epidemic of, of uh, drug toxicity deaths. Mm -hmm. They have not stood there every day and said that they their hearts go out to the five families in British Columbia who've lost someone tonight from, uh, and will lose someone tonight. Mm -hmm. Tonight, somewhere in BC, five people will, will die um, because of toxic drugs. They have not listened to Bonnie Henry, our public health minister, who suggested decriminalization in a very well done report a couple of years ago. Uh, they have not listened to the drug user advice advisory boards that they created to advise them on drug policy who advocated for a much more robust safe supply program. Um, they have not scaled, they have, they have not done what they've done with COVID. They have not really mobilized people. They haven't, they haven't responded to the emergency they declared five years ago. They have not responded in an emergency fashion. And that could have happened. Mm -hmm. And and why do you think that is? It's whenever uh, drugs come up and you're in a in a political job, it seems that you get paralyzed, mm -hmm. and you get paralyzed because drug policy has been used by politicians for many years to get votes. Yes. And it's all been around public safety. Mm -hmm. You know, we're gonna we're gonna make Salt Spring Island a safe place. We're 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 gonna run all the drug dealers uh, out of town. We're gonna lock them up. We're gonna. Uh, it's it's been a very very simplistic sort of way politicians have uh, responded to uh, issues of drugs, and it's sort of the same old same old rhetoric over and over and over again and, and you hear it you, you still hear it in announcements of funding for the rcmp and they're going to 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 to, to tackle organized crime and it's been going on for years and years and years and it doesn't really go anywhere and that's mm -hmm. why i think it's a, it's a pr sort of they got to say this stuff they got to give the police something uh, it, it, it's it's so it, it's so tragic that's that it's so it's so maybe, that no, nothing is things are getting worse they're, not, they're changing yes they are changing but they, they're getting worse in, in fact um, so uh, it, it's it's because of uh, drug policy has lived in the shadows for so many years this, this policy we find on that punishes uh, and coerces people and uh, actually actually creates a free market in on the uh, illegal side of the equation um, 
we don't seem to be able to see our way through the uh, to any other way of doing it. And there's so much fear of drugs. Mm-hmm. We think enforcement is it's sort of a logical reaction. Oh my mm-hmm. God, there's mm-hmm. something awful happening in my community called the police um, to get rid of it. But it's us. We use substances. We it's it's we are the enemy, mm-hmm. <laughs> sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So there, there is um, a real judgment around that. I, I I see that and I hear that in the rhetoric and you know in society as a whole. Um, still, the idea of decriminalizing, you know, drugs is something that brings up a lot of fear or uh, misunderstandings for folks around how that's going to impact them because it's been tied to this idea of safety. And I think, you know, if we look at what is safe, you know, how do we create safety for all? So if we have drug users and there are drug users in our society that are at risk and exponentially more at risk because of the illegal drug market, what about their safety? So, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are about how we dispel some of that fear and stigma and misinformation that people still hold. Um, I know I was taught it. I grew up in the eighties and, you know, we, I was taught drugs are, you know, drugs are bad. Don't do drugs. Drugs will hurt you. And there was this whole, you know, increase in terms of the war on drugs. Um, And that's information that gets embedded into our brains in terms of that. So how do we shift our judgments or, you know, open up to, um, a possibility where there is increased safety for those most at risk. Yeah, I think one of the one of the things that has helped many of us, uh, and I know in my drug policy work with the city of Vancouver in the two thousands, um, it was actually uh, embracing people who use substances and bringing them into the discussion, mm-hmm. so that you know, you, you begin to realize that you know, some of the smartest and most reasonable people on the planet are people who are using substances are being chased by the police every day and, and, and hearing them, uh, hearing them uh, talk about their, the reality of their lives uh, brings a certain uh, empathy, but also normality. These are people are normal. Uh, these are, you know, friends friends and sons and uncles and all that sort of stuff they're part they're part of our community and uh, certainly where i've seen um that sort of be supported by health authorities and governments municipalities um it, it's an incredible uh, shift in the way uh, uh policies are designed, programs are designed, uh, and who comes to what tables to make decisions. Um, so that there's a whole expertise that has been left out of the equation for so long because people have been so highly marginalized, stigmatized, pushed aside, pushed into the shadows. And now you're hearing some very articulate uh, people who use drugs or used to use drugs um, just helping us figure this out what will work how will decriminalization work well let's sit down and talk to uh people who use drugs how will it work it will only work if it if it if it actually takes the burden of uh, the the criminal law off of people's shoulders Mm -hmm. and so we have to get it right we have to uh um figure out what what is the amount that people use and, and what what should be decriminalized as a first, very, very first step. Um, okay, great. The, the question, one of the questions that I have, and I, I've been thinking about this and wanting to hear your explanation, because I think it's important for people to understand is what is the, what does decriminalization mean and how is it different from legalization? Because sometimes there's a confusion around what that is. And I think, you know, a second part of the question is, or how, why, why, how has, how has criminalization impacted people? Like, what is the, what is the impact that it has had to um, folks with, who are using substances? Yeah, criminalization is, is, is very, uh, it's devastating for people who, you know, every 
morning when they wake up, they have to go out into a criminalized environment to buy a criminalized product of unknown toxicity. Um, and that's the, the stigma, uh, where, where do you use, you know, you can't use, it's furtive use, um, you use alone. Uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole environment that's created by uh, the criminalization of a fairly normal activity, consuming a substance uh, to alter your consciousness or kill pain or so we, many of us do it every day. Um, and the stigma attached to that, uh, if you look at the history of our literature and our cinematography, you know, drug dealers, drug users are always portrayed as, you know, out of control, scary, dangerous, desperate uh, people. Um, you know, you could probably do the same thing with stockbrokers or people who work in, in the, the stock market, you know, they're look pretty crazy what they're doing every day too but it's, it's never portrayed as being that dysfunctional um, um so criminalization is devastating and it follows people around if they have contact with the criminal justice system the more contact you have with the criminal justice system the worse thing the worse it gets um it's it's just uh, not uh, something you can easily shake off um and so, so it's a huge burden and it, it's such an unnecessary burden for something as um, simple as using a substance or possessing a controlled substance. So decriminalization is really trying to say um, as a society, it's, it's walking the talk of this is not a... Uh, substance use is not a criminal issue. It's a health and a social issue. It doesn't necessarily have to be a health. Lots of people use substances without health problems. Um, so, you know, we pretend to think we're a fairly uh, informed society uh, and we're, health is something that's embraced by all Canadians. Um, but that would really, we'd really walk the talk uh, of uh, addiction and substance use being a health and social issue as opposed to a criminal issue. Mm -hmm. And so it would be decriminalizing possession of a controlled substance up to a certain threshold. So whatever that threshold is, it needs to be set um, and it probably needs to be changed now and then and evaluated depending on what drugs and uh, people's tolerance uh, needs to be set at a, the right sort of threshold that it really does get the, the law out of my life if I'm simply using a controlled substances substance for my own personal use, the law, I, I am not criminalized. Mm -hmm. My drugs can't be taken from me. They're my possession. Um, I'm not trafficking uh, in drugs. I'm not a dealer, a, a, a big-time dealer. And there's a whole sort of... Uh, there's a whole big area to explore there because in the criminal law share, if I share drugs with you, if I go out and buy some drugs and I share it with you, I'm, I'm legally trafficking. Mm. So we would like to see a decriminalization that sees substance use as a social activity, a personalized activity and ritualistic in many, in many cases. Um, where you are, you just use your substances. You may use them in a social setting, uh, you may sell some to your buddy, um, but that kind of normal substance using uh, activity we're used to when you think of alcohol or you think of cannabis or you think of uh, even tobacco. Um, people aren't criminalized for, for using substances in that way. So, so that is the challenge with decriminalization, getting that part of it right. The problem with decriminalization is that it doesn't affect the supply side of things. Right. So the supply is still, and that's why people are often very uncomfortable with decriminalization, um, because the the sort of the bigger toxic threat right now is from the supply side of things. So the, we really need a combination. Of, of a decriminalization of personal use to reduce the stigma on people to uh, 
in terms of the public health, the sort of uh, overdose crisis or drug toxicity crisis, uh, it, to allow help people feel more able to engage and less fearful of engaging uh, if they're not criminalized. Um, but we also need to, at the same time, uh, as a, that would be a good public health move, decriminalization of possession for personal use. We also need to somehow replace the toxic drug supply. And that's, that's you know, if you talk to people who use drugs, they want access to a pharmaceutical grade supply of drugs. And uh, we, we need to do that in, uh, as a way of protecting consumers. Uh, mm. Right now, there's no consumer protection for people who use substances. It's uh, it's very deadly time. Uh, so we need to we need to pair those, those those two interventions that we could do right now. We could do today. We could do those uh, as part of a response to the overdose crisis. I think this piece around safety, you know, it comes up for me when I think about uh, the illegal and toxic uh, drug supply is, is how there is no um, assurance in terms of safety for folks because of the supply. Um, how, has, uh, how has the pandemic, I know I talked to you earlier about this on a different call, but in terms of the pandemic, and um, how has it changed the level of toxicity in the drug supply? The pandemic has really, really brought to brought to a focus that issue of uh, of safety and consumer safety, mm -hmm. uh, because the uh, within weeks of uh, COVID hitting Canada in mid March. Um, late March, within within days, really, the uh, people were reporting that the drugs market had changed. Mm. And over the next uh, month or two, we quickly saw the numbers going up. And the coroner then began reporting that uh, she was finding increased uh, concentrations of fentanyl and fentanyl analogs in uh, the deceased uh, that she was examining. Mm -hmm. So something changed in the market, uh, whether it had to do with supply chains, um, uh, I, I don't really know, we don't really know, uh, but supply chains were disrupted when the borders were closed, uh, maybe different actors are supplying product, different actors are making the products and mixing the products. Um, but the, the border closures seem to have had uh, a very negative impact, which, which continues to this day. I mean, I just read the data coming out of the, uh, coming out of the BC CDC, uh, and there are a lot of very, uh, very severe overdose, um, uh, cases this this month this week mm -hmm. um, it, ju it just continues so um, the notion that we could you know put so much energy into protecting people from covid and so little energy into protecting people from uh, toxic drug mark by offering them just just as we're offering people vaccines now where can you go get a vaccine now a number of pharmacies. Mm -hmm. Well, there's 1,300 pharmacies in BC. Drug users could be going to pharmacies, 1,300 of them, to get safer drugs uh, if we were really serious about replacing the supply. Mm -hmm. We'd need a workforce to do that. We'd need outreach people to, to reach out to people who are using alone. Many people are, are dying alone in their room. Um, if they were decriminalized, we would be encouraging them to engage in health services. Um, we would be doing all the things that is happening under COVID, you know, creating the contact tracers and the massive workforce to uh, to outreach to people and find out and tr track where the, the virus is coming from and going to. And um, it's it, it's stunning to see the the disconnect between between the two. There has been none of that with mm -hmm. the very little i mean there's been some some things have happened but there's been none of none of that thinking that public health emergency response thinking you know when 17,000 
52 people or 57 people die in your province in one year. That is a public health disaster. Mm -hmm. And we haven't seen that response. And uh, that's what is so... It's clearly driving me crazy, as you can tell. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I really, you know, it's it's you're very clear about um, <laughs> these pieces that are demonstrating inequities in our system, what we care about, where we put priorities to. Um, I know that right now with the pandemic, more people are using a loan, so that increases their risk factors. There's less access to services. And um, it is it is a you know clear example of of um, what's possible if we put our minds and you know efforts and focus together. Yeah, and, and who's being who's being hit hardest by drug overdose? Indigenous people, <laughs> uh, uh, black people, people of color, uh, marginalized people. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's people experiencing it's, it's, poverty. Yes, just the yes. same over and over and over again, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just tragic. It's just tragic. Um, I'd like to pull us back to uh, the idea of you know our our current drug policies and some of their roots. You and I've spoken before about uh, inequities within the system. And yes. I'm wondering if you could talk more about the roots of the policies. Where did our drug policies originally come from in Canada? And what has the, what is the detrimental impact it has had on marginalized people? Well, from the get-go, they've had an impact on marginalized people. They were, you know, the foundations of our, of what we have today were constructed in the early part of the 19th century. And it was this, sort of confluence of colonialism, a global sort of global drug policy framework was evolving and it imbued with colonial values that that uh, favored some drugs over other drugs or some substances over other substances like alcohol and tobacco, uh, for example, weren't, weren't made illegal. Um, in Canada, we like to say, working here in Vancouver, you know, drug prohibition in Canada really started in Vancouver, started in Chinatown with a, a, a race riot. Um, there were opium factories that were working in, in Vancouver, uh, three opium factories that uh, whose clientele were the, uh, the Asian uh, people who had helped build the railroads. And uh, after the railroads were done, there was a lot of people hanging around looking for work. And there was this sort of, you know, British Columbia is a fairly, has fairly white supremacist roots. And uh, the anti-Asiatic society was very upset with uh, uh, both the, well, there was also the confluence of the temperance movement at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so there was this this whole move to sort of uh, Asian Asian workers were threatening uh, white workers' jobs. Uh, there was a whole sort of campaign to uh, denigrate the opium uh, smoking parlors where where people would smoke opium, and um, it just degenerated into a situation where. Uh, the, the Anti-Asiatic League had a march and they walked through Chinatown and destroyed all sorts of storefronts mm -hmm. and it got national attention. And the uh, uh, in Ottawa, they it was used as an opportunity to um, implement their developed draft, the first uh, sort of uh, prohibition law, the Opium Act in 1908. And from then, it sort of, grew uh, based uh, the confluence of and the drug laws were always targeting, uh, you know, uh, poor people uh, who are white, uh, indigenous people, uh, immigrants. Um, they were, were always harsh on, on those populations. And by 1929, we had some of the harshest drug policies in the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, possession was a seven thousand dollar fine um and uh whipping uh was at the discretion of the judge so wow. this is wow. a very barbaric barbaric policy mm -hmm. that we implemented in our country um indigenous people didn't didn't 
alcohol was prohibited. Prohibition uh, lasted uh, into the 40s, I believe, uh, with the uh, indigenous people. So, so it was, it, it was uh, the combination of sort of racism, the temperance movement, and uh, the emergence of a patent medicine market that was trying to take control of these uh, substances that were previously not regulated in any way at all. Um, so some were prohibited and some moved into a regulatory uh, framework. Um, and that's really what we have today to uh, the foundation of our current, current policies. Um, criminalization, punishment, um, coercion, um, the stigma, um, and, and none of that leads to well-being for people who have some uh, propensity to use a substance for any number of reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that that's one of the major problems with our drug policies that that we're, we've been stuck for so long. The Ladane Commission in 1972 uh, talked about heroin prescription programs, talked mm -hmm. about decriminalization of cannabis. That's a long time ago. Um, yeah. So we, so it's time to it's time to move. It's time to uh, um, chart a, a new path forward and um, find uh, enough people that will give politicians the ease to actually uh, move forward on some of these things. We've seen it on cannabis with Trudeau. We've seen it on harm reduction with Philip Owen, the mayor of Vancouver. Now Kennedy Stewart is being quite active. Um, we need that political leadership and we need to figure out a way to help our political leaders uh, do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, if we were to make these radical changes, radical in the eyes of some, um, within our country on drug policy and, and use, um, what other models have been done across the world? I know, you know, there's idea, um, information around Portugal and, and other places. What countries uh, would we look to for examples of success and what, what learnings could we take from their experiences to support and advocate for um, outcomes here. Um, there's there's examples in a range of countries. Portugal decriminalized uh, drugs uh, possession for personal use in two thousand and one, which was you know very very early in this whole you know sort of discussion of a transformation. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, they have their um, they have their story about that, and that was that was a very you know I think a profound. Thing to do at the time, um, uh, Switzerland uh, invented their, the sort of the low threshold approach to harm reduction that uh, that actually brought people in from the cold, allowed them to use uh, supervised consumption sites, and they prescribed began prescribing heroin to heroin users instead of them having to buy from the illegal market. These are these are sort of radical at the time and. Um, important sort of steps forward in sort of ch chipping away mm -hmm. at the monolith, monolithic drug policy that needs to sort of come down. Um, there are some countries that never did criminalize substances. They had other ways to, you know, penalize people for, for using them, but they weren't criminal penalties. They were more administrative uh, penalties. Uruguay is one of them. Uh, parts of Spain have, have uh, done that. There are uh, Spain has some very interesting models around cannabis social clubs and acknowledging that people who smoke cannabis or use cannabis want to grow it too. So they have sort of small sort of social cooperative clubs to use substances. Uh, we, we in Canada have uh, innovated compassion clubs for uh, cannabis users for many, many years. There's talk of a compassion club for cannabis, I mean, for heroin users now. And I think you'll see a pilot project emerging there. Um, so there's there's bits and pieces where the monolithic global drug policy has been challenged on certain fronts. Uh, I, there's, no, there's no country that has actually said, 
you know, we need to regulate all drugs uh, through a, a public health regulatory framework and we'll figure that out. No one's gone that far. Um, so that that's really where we need to uh, need to go. We need to we need to do what we do with all the other substances, mm -hmm. actually regulate them and get our heads around that we need to give people a reasonable access to substances that they want to use. Lots of people hate alcohol. Alcohol is terrible for lots of people. They don't want it. They want some other substance. Um, why should we um, prohibit substances when there is such a demand for them uh, and we can devise ways to regulate them that can protect uh, individuals and, uh, and communities? Great. Thank you so much, Donald. Um, I have a few other questions. Those are my questions. I had a few other questions from other forum members. Um, one question is, do you see any relationship between the increase in drug use and real decrease in wages in recent years? Do you, do you see a connection there in terms of real life wages and, and living costs and increase in drug use? I think Bruce Alexander, Professor Emeritus at SFU, he's done a lot of work. He's written his his wonderful book called The Globalization of Addiction. And um, he, he's probably the most articulate. He lives on Pender Island. Oh, um, another islander. He, he's a Pender <laughs> islander. And he's a wonderful person who has sort of charted the history of addiction and, and the growth of addiction. And he puts drugs into, drugs are just one thing people become addicted to. Um, and it, it is about our society and the way it's evolved, the, the, the type of capitalism that we have uh, created that has been harmful for so many, so many uh, people, so many societies, so many uh, uh, indigenous people around the world. Um, not to mention the environment. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yes, that definitely the, there's a sense I, that I feel there is a fraying of our of our sort of social contract with each other, and uh, um, there's more desperation I think in society at this time. Um, I think again, COVID has exposed a lot of a lot of shortcuts with our social safety net um, as we're taking shortcuts with our seniors care and, uh, and all sorts of other areas. So um, we, we addiction, he would argue addiction is increasing to all sorts of things, computers, shopping, mm -hmm. pornography, um, sugar. Um, you just, just, it, it's something we, it, it's, we're, we're the canaries in the, in the, in the coal mine. You know, when we see our, our, our people becoming less functional on a number of measures, then it's, it's real cause for concern. It's not the drugs that are the problem. Uh, drug, you know, drugs, problems with drugs are a symptom of something else. Mm -hmm. um, that's the other big shift we have to, we have to make and, and sort of really pay attention to that mm -hmm. in a, a profound way. Um, Thank you. I, oh, I, oh. I, I do... Um appreciate what you're saying around paying attention to what the roots are, what's that deeper, deeper piece that's happening. It isn't specifically about the drug itself. It's about um, our human nature in the face of the, some of the struggles that we have in our lives. So hoping, yeah. People talk about the roots of addiction. We have to get to the roots of addiction. Well, you know, um, in, indigenous people will say, "Well, the roots of addiction are for us are in colonization." You know, we're 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 still getting over that, and uh, that that is that is lives on and on and on. And we as a society, you know, yes, we do need to get to the roots of the problem. But you know, that's a that's an empty phrase because to do that, we get time out, folks. Time out. We that's hard work. We need to look ourselves, look in the mirror and say, okay, you know, I'm on a treadmill. We are, many of us are on a treadmill and we, we won't take the time. I don't have time to look. I don't have time to 
our staff group talked about reading the, t- the truth and reconciliation uh, recommendations today and the missing, murdered missing women's inquiry recommendations before we can begin to develop a, a justice, equity, uh, diversity, and sort of strategy for our organization. Okay, well, let's make time. Let's mm-hmm. make time for mm-hmm. that. Let's not try and re- reinvent things mm-hmm. again. Let's and it, and let's it sounds daunting, but you know the t- truth and reconciliation report. It the the you know condensed summary. I think is three hundred pages. It's an it's you know it is readable. It's impactful. It makes a difference. Yeah. And you know what a difference it would make if if everybody took that time and commitment to actually read read that and absorb it. It it. It can be transformative in that way. So, um, so my my dream would be that we would we would first of all, some politicians have to say, okay, yes. time out. Yes, they have to. It's like if you you know, say if you have a drug problem, you have to acknowledge it. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. we acknowledge we have a drug policy problem. Yes, yeah, and and we are going to take the time, bring people together to better understand what a new system would look like mm-hmm. of responding to substance use in our society. Mm-hmm. And that that would be powerful. It would mm-hmm. unleash the creativity. I remember with cannabis, when we got to the point of not arguing whether to legalize it or not, it was when we got beyond the whether to, it became the how to. Right. That was a really creative process. Everyone wanted to be involved in that. So there were winners and losers in that. It's not the perfect process, but uh, uh, not the perfect uh, system. But it it was the how to that was the important mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and engaging part of the the, the journey. Mm-hmm. Um, so I we're hooped if we if we don't. Mm-hmm. We are not going to fix this. <laughs> we're not going to fix what we have. Yeah. It's the old, the old car analogy. It's yeah. It's time for time for new new Get wheels. Get rid of it. I have um. <laughs> I have one last question, and it ties into this piece that you're talking about. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the Getting to Tomorrow project? So, um, I I read. I took the time to read, you know, uh, information and, and sort of the package on getting to tomorrow project. And there's a component in there around dialogue and um, building understanding. Um, great information around harm reduction and the paradox of prohibition and other pieces. What would you like to share with you know, folks that are listening to our conversation about the Getting to Tomorrow project and how people can actually be a voice of support for some of the things that we've talked about today. Um, Getting to Tomorrow project, it it came out of a report we, our organization did on drug policy in Canada in 2013, I think. Um, And we called it Getting to Tomorrow. And even at that time, we were acknowledging the uh, the numbers of overdoses that were appearing in the community. So getting to tomorrow is sort of, it's for people who use substances on the streets of our towns and cities and villages, just getting to tomorrow is a challenge yeah. without dying. Mm-hmm. Like seriously, I mean, every day is terrible when you're, when you now when you have such a a toxic drug supply getting to tomorrow is also getting to the new place Mm -hmm. getting to the new drug policy for canada so it was a i don't know we just got stuck on that name we're not sure what the marketers would say they might have thought it was a dumb name but it it really meant a lot yeah i i i I get the sense that there's momentum there there's a movement there's an action that needs to take place oh good yeah Wonderful. You got it. I got um, it. So, so, and really, really, my experience is that this is a complex issue. It doesn't, it doesn't change without a certain number of factors. Uh, and much of those have to do with uh, having informed dialogue and discussion. Your politicians need to be informed. Community leaders need to be informed. Faith leaders need to be informed. So they're not just mouthing the same old, empty rhetoric about the drug war and 
we're going to deal with this problem by mm-hmm. getting tough and all mm-hmm. that sort of shit. Or, or, or we're going to build a big treatment center and that's going to solve all our problems. That's mm-hmm. not going to work either. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it's, uh, we applied to Health Canada for some funding and uh, we have, we have the multi-year funding to hold community dialogues uh, across Canada. And of course it was designed pre-COVID. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> we were going to be breaking bread with community mm-hmm. and uh, bringing people together from all walks of life, people who use drugs, uh, people who don't use drugs, people who love drugs, people who hate drugs, um, and and really trying to uh, inform each other about what our fears, concerns uh, were, what the scientific evidence is. We have so much more evidence now about harms and the much of our harms emanate from the policy. Right. You know, safe injection sites are protecting people from bad drugs, which are created by our drug policy. I mean, if the drugs were all pure, you wouldn't have so much uh, so much harm. Um, so, yeah, we, we've launched. We just got it up and running, and so we had to totally retool it to be Zoom meetings or Zoom dialogues. We're working with the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University, the Morse J. Moss Center for Dialogue. We, we're at Simon Fraser University as well. We're in the Faculty of Health Sciences. And um, we're working with communities across the country now to develop. Uh, we've had a couple of dialogues in Montreal, and we had a New Brunswick-wide uh, dialogue where we brought people together to talk about what was happening in their communities around this issue. Um, we we see the dialogue with some content um, and then we we back away and the center for dialogue works their magic around uh, sort of a deliberative dialogue about uh, a way forward uh, for our drug policy so we're talking to uh, multiple communities now we have a, our next dialogue is in with the yukon um, a, a very vibrant organization in uh, Whitehorse Yukon Blood Ties for Directions uh, works with people who use drugs and they're co-hosting a, uh, a dialogue in Whitehorse and um, hopefully bringing some people in from uh, other parts of Yukon. Mm-hmm. COVID will allow that. Well, it's, it's good work that you're doing with, with all of the pieces that you um, work for and advocate for and I, I am so grateful, Donald, for you for everything that you are doing these days. Yeah. Well, great to meet you and uh, thank you for your interest. And uh, it's something that uh, is hitting every community in the country. So um, please be in touch, drugpolicy.ca and um, let us know how we can be engaged. Mm -hmm. So Donald, on behalf of the Salt Spring Forum, I I really want to express our gratitude. You know, I'm the Zoom land, so it's it's great to be able to have the conversation and share it with others, um, because it is so important for people to understand what's happening, uh, what is possible, and I really hope through the dialogue and through the actions that you and your coalition are taking that the politicians and decision makers can really hear um, what what could be transformative and. Um, just for others. So thank you. Thank you.